Um, Martin, what are you doing and what bring you, brought you today? Well, right now I'm thinking, like a lot of people, about AI, although I'm interested in the history of storytelling. I'm a cultural historian, so I always try to use the emergence of something new like Gen AI to look back into the past, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. To, to look back into the past, it's necessary for all of us that we have an idea of history. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steffi. It's great to be back here. So yes, as I, as I mentioned, uh, most people, when they encounter a new technology, they, I think, get excited about it because it gives them a glimpse of the future, of things to come. You feel like you're already, you, you, you can sort of divine what the future might be. Um, I can get into that mode as well, but for me, what I find most exciting about a new technology like AI is that it allows you to look into the past in a new way. It obliges us, a new technology obliges us to think about the prehistory of that technology. It changes really our conception of history and allows us to think about how human history worked its way up to that new moment, to that new technology, in this case, AI. So this is what I'm trying to do, to think about the prehistory of generative AI. Now, always when I am in the business of thinking about the future and, and the past, I'm very mindful of Dante. In Dante's Inferno, he identifies false prophets, those who make false predictions about the past, and he puts them in the eighth circle of hell, ditch number four, and with a kind of punishment that looks like this. You have your head screwed on backwards as a punishment for having made false predictions about the past. Now, I'm not saying that this is a particularly pertinent warning for anyone in this audience. I'm just saying that I'm going to take it as a kind of cautionary tale about predicting the future. So instead of predicting the future, I'm going to predict the past. So what does the past, what does human history really look like if we take as our starting point the arrival of generative AI and if we want to look back at, what, at crucial inflection points in the past and how they have brought us to the current moment? The origin, if you will, of artificial intelligence. And the origin I want to propose today takes place not that far from Dante's Inferno. It takes place in the underworld, but not in the Italian underworld, but in the Egyptian underworld. How do you get into the underworld? Well, usually you have to die. But the ancient Egyptians found another way, namely the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead depicts this scene, which is all over the New Kingdom. And it's a scene that's to be read from left to right. It begins with the, with the god Anubis, who has, holds the soul of a recently departed human being, and he brings it to the entrance of the underworld. Um, then we see him again, and now he is putting the soul on a scale, the scale of Maat, the goddess of justice, and it, the soul is being weighed against the feather of truth. If the soul is lighter than the feather of truth, all is well, it will go into the underworld. If the soul is heavy of sin, then it will make the intimate acquaintance of this figure here, Amit, which is a monster with the mane of a lion, the hind legs of a hippopotamus, and the head of a crocodile, and it will eat the soul, and that will be game over. So this is what the underworld looks like, the entrance to the underworld for ancient Egyptians. But the scene is not over yet. As you can see, there is something going on on the right. And you can see that not just because there's more stuff to talk about, but because of all the other figures, Anubis, Amit, and even the goddess of justice, Maat, they're all looking over there. They have their heads turned. And not just because they're Egyptians and always walk sideways, they're looking at someone over there. And this is the god Tot. 
The god Todd, as you can see, holds a writing pad and a stylus. He records everything that is going on in the scene. He records the outcome of the weighing of the scale. And that turns out to be crucial. Without Todd, the scribe, nothing happens. Todd is the god of the scribes, of scribal schools. In Egypt, you have, thanks to writing, the first white-collar jobs in the world, probably. And so they all, all the, the white-collar workers, pray to Todd. But he also has religious significance. He's even involved in the creation of the world. And here, he guards the entrance to the underworld. And that's a sign that writing has become crucial here, and that this God brings together and fully understands or understands the significance of writing for Egyptian culture, which makes possible everything from the building of the pyramids to the administration of a large empire, and also in terms of religion. So this is the God I want to start with. If you were, should you be looking for a God to pray to in the age of generative AI, I think Todd would be an excellent choice. There's one more thing I want to say about the Book of the Dead, and that is the base technology that makes this writing revolution, which ultimately is a revolution in symbolic thinking possible, is the material on which this is written, and that is papyrus, an incredible invention that, makes, that basically powers this cognitive revolution in ancient Egypt because it's light, it's cheap, it's ubiquitous, and I started to think of the Nile Valley as the papyrus valley of the ancient world where this revolution takes place. Okay, so we have the god of writing, of the god of this kind of technology that allows for kind of cognitive offloading, storing of information, retrieval of information that pervades everything. But he's not the only god. There is another deity I want to introduce you to, and that is Sarasvati, an Indian goddess. Most clearly, she's identified here with a musical instrument, but she also is the goddess of writing. She holds a big stylus in her hand. Indian goddesses often have four to eight hands, so she holds many implements. So she's also the god, goddess of writing, very much the Indian counterpart to Tot. But she's also the goddess of mathematics. And this is why I want to single her out, because Indian mathematics turns out to be crucial for the ultimate development of AI, because Indian mathemat mathematicians invent the number zero, and therefore introduce a whole new, much more abstract conception of what a number can be, um, and uh, invent the earliest forms of algebra. And they turn out, of course, to be crucial for uh, the ultimate invention of AI. So how does this writing and math-based revolution get around the world? It starts in India and then moves to Baghdad, because in the Middle Ages, we are now in the Middle Ages, Baghdad is a new city, and at the center of the city is some, a place called Bait al-Hikmah, which is called the House of Wisdom, or the storehouse of wisdom. And this is where you can see, again, that the storage information is crucial. And what people at the storehouse of wisdom do is they translate all available knowledge into Arabic, including Indian mathematics. And the person who is crucially involved here is Mohammed al-Khwarizmi. He uses, he uses Indian mathematics, translates it into Arabic. And from uh, Baghdad, that knowledge now travels to Spain, which has since been conquered by the Muslims, um, and brings that knowledge, that mathematical knowledge, to Europe. European mathematicians are very happy about it. However, they sort of misunderstand his name. Instead of al Khwarizmi, they hear al Ghorizmi, and that gives us the algorithm. And the algorithm now starts uh, to move around Europe, to other centers of learning, to Paris, to Oxford, where it ultimately ends up, in many hundreds of years later, in the hands 
of Alan Turing, and the rest is history. So, a prehistory of artificial intelligence that basically says that we humans have been artificially intelligent, intelligent for thousands of years thanks to this bundle of technologies that allowed us to store and, and retrieve information, both based on numbers and writing, but not just store and retrieve, but also manipulate, combine, that creates new knowledge. So all of that means is that we shouldn't think of artificial intelligence, as some people do, as this strange alien force that somehow has suddenly erupted into our midst, but as an extension of the uh, kinds of base technologies, such as writing and mathematics and the number zero, that are coming together here, and an extension of that kind of technology that has made us humans artificially intelligent for thousands of years. Now, to be sure, human brains process language and writing these base technologies differently from Gen AI, and that's an interesting difference, but it is ultimately an extension to, of what we have been doing for a long time. So this is my look back at what does the past look like from the perspective uh, of AI. Um, so here we are, and what does this mean for the future? Now, again, it's always dangerous predicting the future because you may end up like this figure in Dante's eighth circle of hell, but I'm just, I always also, this is a frightening figure, but I also weirdly identify with him because as you can tell, I like to look back. Uh, I've just told a new history of humanity based on AI, but for a second reason as well, because I think for me, the most exciting thing about a gen AI is that it allows us a new access and really kind of revolutionary access to the past. And there's one particular way in which I've tried to play with that, and that is to, I've been creating in the past year about 20 or 25 chatbots that allow you to talk to some of the most, in my mind, interesting figures in the past, like Socrates and the Buddha and Napoleon and many other figures. If you go to my website, you can try them out for free. Um, and so I just want to end by thinking a little bit of what it has been like to live with this group of AI agents and regularly have conversations with them, including about AI. They've really helped me come up with the talk I'm giving you right now. Now, as we know, it's, or as we have learned, it's relatively easy to pass the Turing test, because somehow we humans are primed to attribute personhood to a computer that chats with us. Um, and that's fine, uh, and, and that's maybe something we need to be careful about. Um, but I want to replace this image where we somehow attribute personhood to a, a chatbot uh, with this image, which is, I think, really what happens when you, which was what I have been doing and many others who have turned stored knowledge, the, 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 the combined knowledge, the accumulated knowledge that we humans have accumulated for the fa past 5,000 years since the invention of writing under the aegis of the gods Tot and Sarasvati, let's say, and reanimated them. And that, for me, is a real game changer because we've always had that stored knowledge. It's been in libraries and databases and other places, but it's been so hard to access it and get, for example, my students and other people excited about it. And so being able to turn these dead figures that are sort of buried in these libraries and to reanimate them and turn them into live conversational chatbots, that for me is what I find so exciting about it. So. Um, even though I don't want to end up in the eighth circle of, uh, of, the, of hell, I'm going to predict or hope, perhaps, that Gen I will allow us to think and access and think about the past in completely new ways. 
Now, the big question, remaining question for me is, will we actually, will people actually avail themselves of that opportunity? And that is sort of my mission with these chatbots and potentially a, a, a product I'm working on to really use this new technology to give us a new access to the past. Thank you very much.